Okay, we talked last time about what constitutes good design. And we had some wonderful guidelines that we defined. We had some really good characteristics of it. But the one thing that we came back to all the time is that you can't separate the design from the context of the design and the problem that you're trying to solve. All right? So in other words, another way to say that is what would constitute a well-designed website for one problem. If you had the same design for a different website, it would probably not necessarily be a good design. All right? It's entirely context-dependent. It depends on the problem that you are trying to solve. So what we want to do is we want to define a process that we can come up with for coming up with a well-designed website. And really, our conclusion, at least my conclusion, was that it's all about goals. Okay, it's about goals. It's about satisfying the goals of the site. <laughs> and of course, there's going to be two groups of people that have goals for the site, right? The organization has goals, and the site users have goals. So the first phase we're going to talk about is the strategy section. And the strategy section is all about defining these things. Who the users are, what the goals of the organization are, what the goals of the users are. There needs to be some overlap between the goals of the users and the goals of the organization creating the site, right? If, they, if there isn't, then the site's going to be useless, all right? So, therefore, uh, we have to take into account both sets of people in defining that. What we're going to do is something like this. Here's a, a graph I draw in all of my classes. I'm not sure if I've drawn it in this class yet, but it's a graph that looks like this. And it compares the cost of making a change to some system. All right? Doesn't matter what kind of system it is, any kind of technology system. In fact, the same thing probably applies to a house. All right? That kind of system. The cost of making a change to it as compared to the phase. Uh, Generally speaking, in most software development, we talk about the analysis, design, build, implement, and test, and finally maintenance. Maintenance is where the system is live and we are making any changes we need to it. And the thing we should notice about this graph is that it increases the further along the process as we go. And that makes sense if you think about building a house, right? If you're building a house, if you're in the design phase of the house where you are working with an architect or a builder and you say you want the living room to be a little bit bigger. Instead of 12 by 12, you want it to be 16 by 16 or something like that. It's relatively easy to make that change then compared to when the house is built and you're living in it, right? Then you got to knock down walls. There's tremendous inconvenience to the family, et cetera, et cetera. So in software, the analysis phase is the phase like the strategy section, where we are uh, deciding on uh, what the goals, what the problem is, what the problem truly is that we're trying to solve, and what the goals of the system are. That's the analysis phase. The rest of the phase of the design part will sort of fit into this category, the design, the other four phases all right, of the design process is this. So what we're talking about in this design document is really the analysis and the design phase. And then building, implementing, maintenance, that's afterwards. So there's a couple implications from this graph. First of all, the graph 
doesn't just increase, the cost doesn't just increase, but it increases at an increasing rate, right? So this is not a linear progression where it goes up in a straight line. This is actually a geometric progression where it increases and it increases more as it increases, <laughs> all right? Uh, my, my, let's see, my, my memory of calculus would say this has a positive first derivative. Anyone, anyone fact check me on that one? I think it does. But anyhow, that's what it means. It increases at an increasing rate. Exponentially. Exponentially, yes. All right. So anything we can do during these phases to do a solid job and to really understand the needs that we're trying to create and develop a system that is easy to change and takes into account the user's needs and the organization's needs. Anything we can do during this phase is valuable. So we're going to spend a lot of effort there. The inclination for everyone is to jump right in and start coding. It will be that way in this class. It will be that way in C-sharp classes you take and Java classes you take. In any programming class, your gut instinct is to jump in and program. Where the better approach is to take a step back, make sure you thoroughly understand the problem, think about how you're going to develop the solution, and then actually do the solution. And again, the specifics that you go through to analyze and, and design the product depends on the particular kind of applications you're working on. In the web environment, it involves the strategy section where we're going to uh, identify the goals of the organization. We're going to identify the goals of the users. The other implication of this is we might not be able to get it down to being a flat linear curve, but we can flatten it out a little bit. All right, so that it doesn't quite get as costly. And we can do that by using good programming standards. All right? Almost anything I do in class, and I say it's a good idea to do this, most of the time it's a good idea because it's going to make the code easy to change. All right? Let's think about some of the things I said a good idea to do. It's a good idea to uh, indent your code in a readable way. Why is that? Because you're going to print it out and hang it on your refrigerator and you want it to look nice? No. All right? We're going to indent it in a good way because that will make it easier for you to go and change the code because you'll see how the tags are nested all right, very easily. And you won't have to sit there and try to figure out, well, is this tag in this tag or is this in this and so on. So the way that you write the code in a neat, legible fashion, you could literally write it all on one line. You could have no carriage returns on it and have a 5,000 character single line with all your tags in it. And the browser is going to understand it just fine. However, if you go back later on and try to change it, it's going to be a nightmare for you to figure out how things are nested. So that's an example of something. And if I, give it, if I, if I say something and say it's a good practice to do that, the reason is usually because it makes a program easier to change. In other words, it flattens out that curve. So this graph is like a driving force in almost everything we do in software development. Uh, putting your CSS in its own file. Is it better to do that or put the CSS on, on, the, on, on the HTML page? Well, which one makes it easier to change? Well, it's, e it's easier to change if it's in a separate file, right? Because then I can have that same CSS file for 100 different pages. If I want to change the shade of green from a dark green to a lighter green, Change it in one place, every page is taken care of. All right? So, implying good practices flattens that curve out a little bit, gives you a little bit better situation to be in. And spending a lot of time in the early phases of the project planning, analyzing, making sure you understand the problem before you start developing a solution is another thing that you can do to uh, make your life easier. So, the analysis phase for us consists of the strategy section where we identify goals uh, for the user and for the organization. Now, a couple of things. First of all, for your assignment, write a paragraph that gives an overview of your project. All right? And be 
be specific. Uh, don't say I'm going to do a, uh, a website about basketball. That is very general, right? You could take a website about basketball a million different directions. Are you writing it about professional basketball or college basketball? Are you writing it from the perspective of fans that want to know information? Are you writing it from the perspective of players that want to improve their game? Are you writing it about the history of basketball or are you writing about the current state of basketball? And so on. So you want to be specific when you define and give an overview of what your topic is. Remember, you have six to eight pages. You can't cover the world in six to eight pages. So therefore, you want to define your topic uh, fairly specifically. The more specific you can define it, the better off you're going to be. And you're, the better off you're going to uh, be when you get to the later stages and actually are creating the site. So define that. You're, you have a luxury that you get to make up your purpose, right? So in the real world, if you're doing this, usually you're doing it for someone else. Either you work for a company that wants to develop a website, or maybe you are coming in as a consultant and are developing a website for uh, a particular organization. Like maybe a restaurant contacts you to develop their website. All right? In which case, you don't get to make up the goals. They'll tell you the goals. They'll tell you what it is that they want to develop. So, in the strategy section, you're going to write a paragraph that gives an overview of what the system is. This is all documented in the, uh, in, in the instructions, but again, I can't pull it up uh, in Canvas, so be sure you read it on your own time. Then you're going to create goals, and you're going to create goals for your organization and goals for the user. All right? The more specific you can make the goals, the better off that you're going to be, right? What could the goals of a restaurant be? What would, what would the goals of the restaurant be? Get people to the restaurant. Get people to the restaurant. That's true. Keep them coming back. Keep them coming back. Make money. Make money. Uh, All right. Show like new items on the menu and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, to communicate the atmosphere of the restaurant, that would be a good goal. Let people know what their restaurant's about so that you can look at it and say, yeah, that's the kind of restaurant I want to go. How many specific items will save that one for a minute? All right, because I'm not sure that is a goal. That might be part of the tactics that you're going to do. All right, all of those are good goals. Now, the more specific you can make them, the better off you're going to be. Like, for example, make more money. Well, yeah, but, you know, unless you're expecting people to come in and just, you know, dump buckets of money at your door, that's, you know, you want to be more specific than that. So maybe, and I heard people say these different things, like attract new customers. That would be a good goal. Get more repeat business. All right. Maybe get more business for Sunday brunch or lunch. Appeal to a different group of people. Like maybe you have a really good dinner crowd, but your lunch crowd is kind of, kind of could be improved. So maybe your goal would be to improve your, your lunch traffic. All right. Uh, attract parties to come to your place. Maybe you have a, a room in the back or maybe, you know, you could, you could, you know, say, hey, if you want to have a birthday party at our restaurant, we have a room in the back that you could rent out and all that. So those are things, those are specific things that could be goals for the restaurant. Now, the users can be a little tricky, all right? Even with a restaurant, you might think that, well, that's not very tricky. People, why do people go to the restaurant? They go there to eat, right? And that's true. But for any website, and especially when you get to larger websites, there isn't one typical user that you can identify and say, this is what our user wants. There's different categories of users, right? In reality, there's 7 billion or so individuals on earth, and they all have their unique needs and goals that they want to achieve. Well, it's hard to develop a website for 7 billion people. 
So you come up with a number of typical user profiles, all right? And we're going to call them personas, all right? Personas. And for this project, I want you to come up with three personas for your site. Let's start out by looking at a very broad website, a, a big website, a college. Think of our website, the Bernie County Community College. Who are some typical groups of people that might be visiting our website? Students. students. And I'm going to put the word current students in front of that. Previous students. Previous students. Prospective students. Students, I heard prospective students. I heard something in the back I didn't couldn't quite make it out. Future students. Yeah, future students. Parents. Parents. Administration. Administration. People looking for jobs. Job hunters. Teachers. Teachers. any administration watches this video on YouTube, I, my, my no is intended affectionately. You know, I'm not worthy to be called an administrator, all right? I, should I wink at the No, I won't wink at the camera. Uh, other groups of people. Foreign students? Possibly foreign students. Donors? So for perspective, would be the same as like um, potential transfer students? Maybe, maybe not. Transfer students. I would say that's a different one because they're, they're going to have different needs. Um, other colleges? Other colleges? Were people collecting data on colleges? Okay. Government agencies. Government agencies? <laughs> Businesses. Community members. And so on. We might even be able to think of a little bit more. So, here's the thing. Those groups, each of those groups has somewhat different needs. Now, there might, might be some overlap, all right? I would think previous students and prospective students, maybe transfer students and foreign students, there might be some overlap there because they, they might be looking for similar sorts of things, all right? But other groups might have totally different sorts of needs, all right? So how do you figure out what to do? Well, ideally, you want to address as many of the goals for as many of the different personas as you can think of. All right? Now, a college is sort of a big site. You know, when we talk about a college, we talk about a big, comprehensive site. There probably are thousands of pages on LC site. And there probably are, you know, a dozen, at least a dozen or so, personas that they ought to consider, all right? Your website is much smaller, but I'm asking you to come up with three personas, all right? Three personas. Now, you might think this is corny, all right? But I actually want you to make up fictional people. Pretend you're writing a, a novel and make up a person. Get a picture of the person, all right? You can go and look filter for Creative Commons license pictures of people, 
and give a fictional name, make up a fictional profile, and identify three goals that that person might have. Let me pull up some personas. I hope the rest of the internet is working nice. Yes. Do you have like the different target demographics? Do you have like one that you're gearing it towards in a more broader sense and then still addressing the other? That could be. If there's one that is, um, if you if you thought, for example, that. Um, you know, that, that, you know, of these personas, there probably are some personas that are given more attention than others on, on, our, on our website. I would think current students and prospective students would probably be the ones that got the biggest focus and biggest attention. And if you looked at our website, I'll bet you you could tell that from the design. But still, there's places you can go to if you're a community member and just want to see what events are happening on campus. There's a, a place that if you're a business and you want to get training for your people to go to and so on. So yeah, it, it, it is true that when you're identifying the personas uh, that uh, some of them uh, might be more important by virtue of the fact that they, they make up a bigger portion of your audience than, than others. So yeah, the, the different personas aren't, aren't seen necessarily as being equal. All right, here is, let me try to find, personas, represent a major group of users for that, express and focus on the major needs and expectations of the most important user groups, in other words, the goals, give a clear picture of the user's expectations, describe real people with backgrounds and values. And they have some questions to ask when you're developing it. What are the goals of the site? What is the age of the person, gender of the person? What is the highest level of education? How much work experience, professional background? Why will they come to the site? And so on. And they show a couple ways that you can do a persona, lay out a persona. And here's an example of it. Keep in mind this is a US government site, so their personas are boring, all right? This person is a USDA senior manager, all right? Maybe you're developing a, a website for the USDA research service. Here's a fictional name, the job title, the background, what his concerns are, what his goals are, what tasks he performs, his environment, and then a typical quote. Now, do you have to do all these things? No, not necessarily. But you should be able to have a good description so you know important information about the person.
And it, it's sort of like a little mind trick to actually give them names and faces. Use pictures of your friends, whatever, all right? Use famous people and give them funny names. That's always good, all right? Uh, and give information about what their role is. I got demographic information and identify their goals a little bit about their level of experience and, and things like that. Let's see another example for maybe a more exciting website. Okay, here's one. Persona example for Penny. This is the kind of style that they might like. Favorite TV show. Website they like to visit. A typical quote. I've got tons of ideas, enthusiasm, I don't know where to start. Favorite color. This kind of thing. There's another group of personas for a website. The other one I assume was for like a home decor site. This one I'm not sure what it is for. A business to business site uh, where they show two personas. They give a picture. Uh, it's kind of hard to read some of this. Uh, but there's personal information, uh, work, what their goals are issues that they currently have, and so on. Let's poke around. All right, here's one, Brandy Taylor, <laughs> profile narrow feet, all right? This is for a shoe store, right? Uh, now, narrow feet is meant to represent what? It's meant to represent people who do not have typical needs as far as shoes go. So you may create one persona. Brandy is represented, uh, specifically has narrow feet. But Brandy is really represented by any person that has a hard time finding shoes that fit them. So someone who is seven foot tall and wears a size 22 would fit in this category too. It's, it's sort of represented by Brandy, right? Because they sort of have the same problems as Brandy does. You could say that. And talks about this motivation. And again, Brandy gets very emotional about shopping for shoes at a retail store because she can barely find a pair that fits. Goals need to fit her tiny feet. Would like to purchase several pairs if they find something. Hoping she doesn't have to sacrifice style. Frustrations, not being able to filter available shoes by width, recommended shoes, and so on. And what this does is this actually takes actual feedback that they got from customers that sort of fit this persona. All right. Now, why do you make these personas? Do you make them just to make them? No, you make them because going forward, for a lot of different things that you're going to consider in the design, you're going to look and say, will what we do, what can we do to satisfy this person's needs? So the one example they gave in that case is the ability to search by width of shoe, all right? So you might have, based on that persona, whose goal is to find shoes of a certain width, to give them the ability to search by width, all right? So that will become a requirement, something that we're going to talk about in the next phase. So everything you do, you focus your attention on 
navigate the site, find the information they need, and so on. So you don't just make these just as an exercise to make them. You make them and then you refer to them when you're making decisions on how to do things, right? Uh, designing a website is all about making decisions. What you're going to put in, what you're going to leave out, how you're going to organize it, and so on. Now, you can make those decisions based on what makes sense to you. However, what makes sense to you doesn't always match what's going to make sense to your users. All right? Uh, we had problems like that on LC's website, and I see a number of colleges have sort of done the same thing, right? I know all the departments at, at LC. I know where we have computer courses, all right? But someone from the outside world, they might just be interested in computer courses. They're not going to know what division offers them, all right? So if we organize our content by academic division, all right, that makes sense to someone that works here. That doesn't necessarily make sense to a prospective student or even a current student. All right? So you develop things with your personas in mind on how they view the problem and how they see the information as being logically organized. All right? So let me review what you're going to have in the strategy section. And this will just be in a Word document. All right? You're going to have a paragraph or so overview of your project. And you want to be as specific as you can. You want to identify the goals for the organization. Here's the nice thing, since you're the organization, you get to make up whatever goals you want. All right, so that's a good thing. So you'll identify three goals for the organization. You'll then identify three personas. And you should do it like I showed the example. Picture, name, brief description of what the person does or what their job role is. And then three goals for each persona. So you have a total of 12 goals. Three for the organization, three for each of the three personas. That adds up to be 12 goals. That's the strategy section. So let's go back to our example about restaurants. Do we identify personas for our restaurant? No. Okay, let's identify some. Let's say we have a restaurant. Let's identify some personas. Couponer. Couponer, someone that wants to save money. Foodie. All right. Travelers. Travelers. Locals. Locals. Couples. Couples. Drinkers, non-drinkers, single diners, and so on. Probably sports fans or something. Sports fans. After work hangout. People with restricted diets. Excellent. We 
restricted diets. Uh, yeah, someone planning an event, and so on. Okay, so again, we have now a lot of these are going to have very similar needs, but some of them are going to have different needs, right? And uh, some of these might have different needs depending on the kind of restaurant you have, right? Uh, if your restaurant is Chuck E. Cheese, you're probably not going to attract foodies or couples <laughs> or. People, well, people planning an event, yeah. Restricted diet, sure. After work hang out, probably not. All right. So some of these might be limited and might not be appropriate for every restaurant. But depending on the specific restaurant that you're talking about, some of these would, would likely apply. And you come up with this. What about... <laughs> yeah, David. Yeah, exactly. That almost fit everything. Uh, very true. Um, let's say <coughs> let's say we're doing a website for a band. So, you know, your friend is in a local band, ask you, and we'll assume that they're local, they're not like some national or international act. What could be personas for a band's website? Scouts. Scouts. Oh, okay. I was thinking like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts <laughs> at first. So I'm like, maybe, if they like new camp songs, you know, if that's how you, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Potential, uh, yeah, uh, talent scouts. They just have fans. Fans? Members. Members of the band, possibly. Venues. Venues. That could possibly be the same as this, but maybe not. Yeah, that could be town scout. Non-fans. Hey, I want to go out this weekend and I look and I see band ABC is playing at a local club. Do I want to go see them? All right? Don't know anything about them. All right? I might click on their link, go to their website, and go and see something about them. All right? Uh, fans, on the other hand, might be interested in going to buy merch, buy recordings, other kinds of stuff. All right? They might want to know more details about the bands. Again, depending on the kind of band schedule. and so on. Yeah, schedule and so on. So again, there's going to be overlap between these, but I think we could say that all of these would have different uh, perspectives. Enough of different perspectives that it's worth to treat them separately and uh, uh, treat them as having their own goals. All right. The goal of, of a venue, let's say, is is this band appropriate for the venue that I am uh, that, that, that I'm, I'm booking for? Uh, is the band skilled enough? Uh, maybe how do I contact the band to negotiate price or something like that? For a non-band, do I want to go and see them? Can I take my kids? All right, and so on. And for a fan, it might be buy merch, where they're going to appear next. Gee, do they have any videos of that show that I saw last week? That sort of thing. Uh, it's not hard, no matter how, what topic you have. I've never had a student come up to me, and you can take this as a challenge if you want, that had a reasonable topic that you couldn't think of three personas for. All right, so it's not always obvious, and it might take a little bit of thought, but if you have something that you want to do it for and you can't think of three personas, talk to me or talk to someone else, and we'll come up with, with three personas. 
At the very least, typically, you have people that are familiar with the topic, people that are not familiar with the topic. That's two, right? Fans and not fans, all right? Prospective students and current students. Current students are familiar with the college, prospective students might not be, right? So you have the people that know something going into the website and people that don't know something going into the website. So you at least have those two groups of people and then usually you can come up with a third. Likewise, usually you can come up with goals. Now, that's the strategy section, all right? If you have questions about it, uh, let me know. You can even turn in your uh, design before it's due, although I would ask you to email it to me. Don't upload it to the Dropbox. The Dropbox is just meant for things that are finished. So if you do the strategy section and you say, hey, uh, you know, uh, email that to me. Don't, don't post it to the Dropbox. All right. It's it's on it's, it's listed on Canvas. I think it, I saw it was April something. Okay. April something. The whole design is due. Canvas is having issues. Today. Canvas is having issues today. Okay. But hopefully by April it won't be having issues. Right. So hopefully hopefully by the end of the day it won't be having issues. Uh, people ask me this, and it is like I appreciate the fact that they have a lot of confidence in me that I would remember like the date that stuff is due, you know, and all that. Or like they'll say I'm working on lab five. And it's like, well, first of all, which of my seven classes are you in? And what was lab five again? You know, so I appreciate the confidence they have in saying that, but sometimes I need a little more help, and that's why it's best to look it up in Angel. Now, here's the thing. Any goal that you have, there's a bunch of ways that you can achieve it. All right? If your goal is to attract new customers to your restaurant, all right, there are many ways that you can do that, right? What are some ways that you could attract more people to your restaurant? Sale. Sale, all right? Better quality food. All right, improve the quality of food. Reach more people. Reach more people. Famous chef. Have good reviews. Famous chef, good reviews. Good atmosphere. Good atmosphere. These are all things that you could do to attract more people, all right? So any goal that you have, or any goal that your users have, you can address that and try to address that in several different ways. And that gets into the second part of the design. The first part was a strategy section, and that's where we deal with goals. The second part of the design is the scope section. And that's where we have a list of requirements. Now, we're not going to finish this today, obviously, because we have probably just a few minutes left. Or we might even be over by now. Got a minute left. Requirements are going to be things on the website that address the goal. All right? Things on the website that address the goal. So. Information about restaurant specials might be something that's on the goal that, that would address the goal of trying to attract new people to your restaurant. Pictures of the restaurant that show people what it looks like might address the need for them to, to get a sense of what the atmosphere of the restaurant is. All right, showing what a nice, showing what a beautiful view it has out the back of the lake or whatever. Uh, might be a way to attract more people. Goals are what you want to achieve by visiting the site. Requirements are the stuff that you're putting on the site that's going to help satisfy those goals. Now, it shouldn't be just basic web design knowledge. Like, a, a requirement shouldn't be, and for that matter, a goal shouldn't be that the site has good navigation, right? Of course you want your site to have good navigation. You know, what would the opposite of that be? I, I, well, this group of users wants bad navigation. You know, it doesn't even make any sense, right? So you're not going to put just general web design principles there. 
it's relating to specific content that you're going to have on the site. Now, last word before we wrap up today, and we'll pick this up on Tuesday, is that every goal that you define better have at least one requirement that addresses it. Right? If your band's website, one of the goals of the fans is to know where they're going to be playing over the next month, yeah, have a calendar on your website that says where you're going to be playing, because that will satisfy that goal. Or it could have multiple things that satisfy the goal. Right? You could have audio samples and video samples of the band to help a new person, a new fan, or, or a, a prospective fan decide whether they would like this band or not. All right. So every requirement should address one goal at least, and every goal should have at least one requirement associated with that. All right. So the requirements are the specific things you're going to do to help achieve the goals of both you and the users. All right. We'll talk more about that next time and give some examples and so on. Please, if you haven't already, read the document. Uh, about the uh, design, and we'll pick up on that on Tuesday. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I know that we're not supposed to address the design and actual what yeah. design, but I mean, different personas have different preference on, say, colors, yes. uh, scheme, or like whatever it is. Like. Is that part of the requirement? That's not part of the requirements. That would come later on. That would actually come when you develop the prototype. All right, the prototype is where you'd actually make sort of rough drafts of your web page. So that comes like later.